Welcome to episode four of our Japan Alaska vlog series with Cunard. Please subscribe to our channel and select the bell to receive notifications of our new content. Thank you. Our tour today is a nature cruise, searching for wildlife. While we would see whales and adorable sea otters, it's a very nice treat to see a bald eagle, one of two we would see today.
our second bald eagle welcomed us with a wonderful flyover. This was our first attempt at playing Coits, a deck game not found on all cruise lines. Clearly, we simply need to take more cruises to practice. So six seconds before liftoff, uh, the space shuttle's three main engines ignite with a deafening roar. At 0.3 of a second before liftoff, uh, the two solid rocket boosters ignite and they immediately reach full thrust. And then at T equals zero, the eight large hold down bolts that uh, hold the shuttle down to the launch pad explode. And freed now from the launch pad, the shuttle including the orbiter Endeavour, the large orange external tank and the two solid rocket boosters leap skyward in a fury of smoke and flame. And with liftoff, I am jolted forward in my seat and riding aboard the space shuttle as it thunders away from its launch site in Florida. Uh, with all five engines at full power is an unforgettable experience. And although securely strapped into our seats, my crewmates and I experience bone-rattling uh, vibration. It is a wild, wild, crazy ride. So Kevin Kriegel, our shuttle commander, is seated forward in the flight deck and to my left. Uh, Pam Melroy, our pilot, is seated forward and to my right. And Kevin and Pam are both former U.S. Air Force pilots and they guide the shuttle during its, its ascent. My role as flight engineer is to keep the crew on the time light and to call out any procedural steps that are necessary. A warning tone sounds. My heart skips a beat. Scanning my computer display, I notify my crewmates. I see the APU speed low message for APU 2. So Pam looks at her displays and she adds, this might be a sensor problem. Uh, my data shows that the APU is still running. So, an APU is an auxiliary power unit. It pressurizes an associated hydraulic system. The hydraulic system in turn drives the gimbals uh, of the three rocket engines which are currently steering our shuttle to a precise location in orbit. And for redundancy reasons, 
the orbiter has three independent APUs. And the brilliant engineers who designed the shuttle back in the 1970s ensured that whenever possible, systems were built to a fail operational, fail safe standard. This means that if a critical system should fail, such as an auxiliary power unit, then a backup system would allow full functionality. And if that backup unit should subsequently fail, uh, well, we may lose function, but at least we'll be able to safely complete the mission. It seems that we now have another problem in a different hydraulic system. So the dropping pressure that Mission Control has reported to us is concerning, it's worrisome, and it may indicate a leak in system number three. So I log these malfunctions into my notebook. So two minutes into the flight, uh, and at an altitude of 45 kilometers, the two solid rocket boosters have used up all of their propellant, and we jettison them. And as they fall away, uh, Kevin blurts out, good riddance, and I laugh. You know, the SRB rockets are wonderful. They're incredibly powerful, but they're so powerful that they're also worrisome. So we are somewhat relieved that this first stage of ascent has gone, has gone well. <laughs> now that the SRBs are gone, the noise level in the flight deck drops dramatically. We race upward on the remaining three main engines. It's a noticeably smoother ride. I glance at the meters on the forward uh, cockpit panels to monitor our speed, and as we approach a velocity of Mach 5, which is five times the speed of sound, uh, I call out to Kevin and Pam, two-engine Tau. So Tau, in astronaut lingo, means transoceanic abort landing. If it's one of the options we could take uh, to end our mission, if something should go wrong at this point in the asset, the panels on the forward cockpit, and I see that the APU overspeed and the hydraulic pressure lights are lit up. I break into a cold sweat. This is serious. It looks like APU number one has just failed due to an overspeed. This is not a good day. So Kevin calls out with some urgency. Two hydraulic systems down and a third one failing Bob. What do the flight rules say about our situation? I think that Kevin already knows the answer, but he wants to hear confirmation from me. Uh, the shuttle's three main engines are operating perfectly and we have enough power to get to orbit. Nevertheless, we must abort our mission and return to the ground as quickly as possible. In addition to being a rocket, the Space Shuttle Orbiter is also an aircraft. And at the end of the mission, when we fly home, at least one working hydraulic system is going to be required to land. With two hydraulic systems failed, and with one leaking, we could have a complete loss of hydraulics at any moment. So we urgently need to get to the ground. Since Endeavour is now too high and too fast to return to Florida, our next best option is a transoceanic landing. A teleport puts the shuttle into a suborbital trajectory. In other words, a giant hop across the, the Atlantic Ocean. A, a TAL is theoretically designed to land the orbiter on a pre-designated runway in Europe or Africa. And I say theoretically because in fact, a shuttle abort landing has never been performed, and I now feel my heart pounding in my chest. With the abort mode now activated, a series of pre-programmed events are initiated. The three main engines need to throttle back from 104% down to 67%. This should happen automatically, but due to the pre-existing hydraulic failures, uh, throttling for two of the engines is disabled. So Pam needs to manually throttle the engines back. Our objective is no longer orbital flight. Our new objective is a controlled re-entry and a safe landing. Everyone gets busy. I deploy uh, new cue cards and keep my eye on the velocity and the range and I turn to the abort pages in my checklist. Kevin monitors Endeavour's guidance and he verifies our landing site. Uh, we're now targeting a runway at the Zaragoza Air Base in northeast Spain. As I see the approaching coast of Spain, uh, 
through the forward windows, I need to update the two of them about one more serious issue. With the loss of APU systems number one and number two, we don't have hydraulic pressure to deploy the landing gear in the nose wheel. So this is not great news from me. So Kevin responds, we'll need to use pyrotechnics to deploy the gear. I hope that works because the pyros will be our last means to get the landing gear down. 400 miles from Zaragoza, our instruments again begin to display tactical air navigation data. Uh, slicing downward through the sky, Kevin takes manual control of Endeavour as our speed as our speed leads down to uh, transonic. The 12,000 foot runway at the Zaragoza Air Base comes into view and at 100 meters altitude, Pam arms and fires the landing gear. And I whisper a prayer, oh God, please deploy the landing gear. My prayer is answered. Seconds later, the pyros fire like howitzers and Pam reports gear down. Kevin brings Endeavour down smoothly at a touchdown speed of 360 kilometers per hour. Pam deploys the braking chute immediately and with the hydraulics failures, uh, we've lost nose wheel steering. So Kevin guides Endeavour down the runway with differential pressure on the, uh, on the brake pedals. And as we come to a stop, I exhale that our vehicle is intact and our crew is safe and accept for the quiet whir of the cabin fans, there's silence on the flight deck. Nobody talks. A bead of sweat that runs down my forehead, drops onto my checklist. Exhausted, I look at my watch. 40 minutes have elapsed from launch to landing. And that must have been the fastest transatlantic trip anyone ever took. The ascent landing that we just flew aboard Endeavour was a simulation. Robert had the entire theater fooled. He went on to champion how training, including running hundreds of scenarios, is vital to being ready for any contingency. We finished our unplanned sea day with a night at the pub. As I was going over the cock and carry mountains, I met with Captain Farrell and his money he was counting. I first produced my pistol, I then produced my rapier. Since starting on the liver for you are the bone to save a richer ring of a new McFar to Daddy O, McFar to Daddy O, there's whiskey in the jar. I counted out his money. It made a pretty penny. I put it in my pocket and I took it home to Jenny. She said and she swore she never would deceive me. But the devil take the women for they never can be easy. With your ring of a do of a da. Back far to daddy o. Back far to daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar. Well, I went into my chamber all for the day to slumber. I dreamt the golden jewels, and for sure it was no wonder. But Jenny took my charges, she filled them up with water, and sent for Captain Farrell to be ready for the slaughter. With your ring, I'm a doom, I'm a Back far to Daddy O, back far to Daddy O, there's whiskey in the jar. It was early in the morning and I rose up for the travel. The guards were all around me and likewise was Captain Farrell. I first produced my pistol, she stole away my rapier. I couldn't shoot the water so a prisoner I was taken. With your ring, I'm a doom, I'm a da. Back for the daddy-o, back for the daddy-o, there's whiskey in the jar. Now if anyone can aid me, it's my brother in the army. I hear he is stationed down in Cork or in Killarney. Hey. And if he'll come and save me, he'll roam near Kilkenny. 
I'm sure he'd treat me fairer than my darling sporting Jenny. What jury do I do? What for the daddy o What for the daddy o There's whiskey in the jar of which you're in a do da ba da What for the daddy o What for the daddy o There's whiskey in the jar Victoria, though not on our original itinerary, is a beautiful city. When customs were finished, many people ventured out to explore. Bouchard Gardens, opened in 1921, was built on the site of a former quarry belonging to Robert and Jenny Bouchard. Today there are five gardens on the 55-acre estate, Sunken, Rose, Japanese, Italian, and the Mediterranean Gardens. Today, the garden is still managed by Robert and Jenny Bouchard's descendants.
We hope you've enjoyed this video. We have lots of cruise content on our channel, so why not watch another video after this? Be sure to check out our full ship tour as well. Thank you for watching.